Hey folks, uh, it's Tea Tuesday. Um, this is we're back. Uh, this week my theme is reaching. <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, theme we had a couple of weeks ago, embracing failure, not that popular. <laughs> wonder why. Uh, we'll see how this one does. Uh, uh, reaching out in a number of ways. So uh, first off, it's outreach. Uh, uh, whoops, and let's get over here. Okay. Uh, uh, I feel like I'm doing a, a lot of outreach all of a sudden and uh, beginning to get a little bit more traction uh, uh, on Twitter and, and so forth. So, you know, right after the last T-Tuesday update, uh, I joined the another Santa Fe Institute uh, collective in w workshop on collective intelligence. Uh, um, uh, I started on Wednesday, September 1st, the day after T2 Subject, but it actually had started on the day before, on T Tuesday. And, you know, as, as usual with these SFI workshops, you know, there were all kinds of interesting talks. And for me, one of the most interesting things was to get uh, folks who have been studying more or less computational takes on uh, human societies, stuff that's actually involving people. Because certainly for the bigger picture uh, of living computation, maybe a little bit beyond just the T2 tile project itself, uh, uh, that is all about understanding larger scale systems, actual living systems, as well as manufactured systems, as well as mixtures of living and manufactured systems, or mi mixtures of natural and manufactured systems, not sure how to say it and how they behave and how they can be organized and how they fail and what we should be watching out for. Henry Farrell was talking about, you know, open access uh, versus, you know, communication strategies that help flooding. I mean, there were lots of interesting talks. Uh, uh, Jacob Foster was sort of a, a sociologist take which was really interesting to me because it's something that I'm, I don't have as much contact with. That was very interesting. Uh, uh, Anna Dornhaus, uh, uh, who I've seen a number of, uh, of talks that she's done, she does all kinds of great stuff. Here she was talking about ants uh, um, and you know how they uh, vary in their communication strategies and what it might suggest. You know, and you know, look at this. <laughs> you know, ant hill in the middle, and, and then this whole apparatus so that the ants have to decide which path they want to take, and no matter which one they take, they're going to be going. Uh, wondering about the purpose of life as they go back and forth. But the result of this is that, you know, there's this uh, relationship between uh, some species of ants are much more oriented towards exploiting it the best uh, that they know right now and dominating, like uh, Solenopsis xyloni, uh, which is a nasty, stinging ant, you know, starship troopers, er, 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 or at the other end, much more oriented towards recovery and flexibility. There is Dory Murmex uh, Insanus, uh, like the T2 Tile Project community. Uh, um, lots of interesting stuff came out of that. Uh, in addition, uh, this had been working, uh, uh, brewing under the hood in the background for a couple of months now, and it, it actually happened. Mark Hurst uh, uh, is a fellow that runs the Tectonic broadcast that is broadcast on WFMU out of New Jersey every week. Uh, and uh, he interviewed me a week or so ago for the open uh, first episode of his fifth season of the Tectonic Podcast, which was yesterday. Uh, um, and that was great fun. And uh, so this is, you know, this is his take on the T2 Tile project, right? Uh, Dave Ackley has a modest goal of re-architecting all computers, you know, well ought to have some ambition. Uh, on the next Tectonic, Mark and Dave discuss how the dangerously outdated ideas creating today's computers, the dangerously outdated ideas, and how Dave's teacher talk about building new decentralized to save the world from big tech. A and, you know, one of my traditional problems is that I am terrified, from a scientific point of view, of overclaiming. And so I, I tend to, you know, I don't make clickbaity titles, although I'm working on it. <laughs> and I try not to uh, get get too far ahead of what the work actually shows. Yeah, um, but it's really refreshing and helpful to see other people's takes coming back uh, at me on this stuff. And, you know, there, there was a chat, uh, you know, he found the uh, the original brick wall uh, construction illustration that he used uh, on the podcast page. And there was all this kind of chat, interesting stuff going on. I joined in, tried to chip in uh, thoughts from here and there and so forth. It was really great. Uh, so Mark, thank you for 
for that. Uh, and, you know, Jeff and Michael, uh, two uh, guys who've been sort of working behind the scenes, uh, 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 helping out with the project for, for years, uh, in, at least for Jeff, uh, um, got this set up, and that was just super great. Uh, so that was the Tectonic Podcast, and that was yesterday. But that's not even the last thing. Uh, then, just last night, uh, Ivan Reese, who is the current steward of the Future of Coding community, which is a podcast and, and all kinds of related material about trying to take a bigger view of uh, programming and coding, uh, which, you know, very compatible uh, uh, with, again, the larger, the Hyperspace Academy stuff, the We Are Coders uh, uh, philosophical perspective that I'm trying to pitch uh, in the bigger picture where the T2 tile is going to is going to fit in as an implementation example that you know part of the whole uh, we are coders philosophy is that the way you can you make you put substance under words you know you can say these things like representation and ideas and truth and who the hell knows what they mean well the point is is we are now in a position that we can build machines you know using regular computers or new kinds of computers whatever uh, uh, that exists exemplifies well maybe what representation means is this maybe what an idea means is this and we can show it and you know it may have more or less to do with how the brain and the mind works but it's an actual concrete thing that we could look at we can poke and we can see how it behaves independent of our uh, uh, conceptions of it and that's what makes it valuable uh, um and Ivan Reese, uh, you know, reached out to uh, invite me to come talk on the Future of Coding podcast, which I, I you know, would be happy to do. Uh, uh, we talked a little bit in Twitter, and uh, it's probably going to be in December. We'll see how that goes on uh, news as it develops. That was yesterday. Future of Coding in December. Uh, uh, and last week's update... <laughs> Intel versus Tesla, uh, uh, it's done relatively well by the standards of the T2 Tile project. I mean, we are seriously nerds here. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the things that certainly was helped driven home by uh, uh, work going doing the, the Tectonic podcast is, you know, regular people... <laughs> Computer stuff, computer architecture, computer programming, that stuff is very, very far away from normal people, the modal person. Uh, um, and so it was important to uh, f figure that out and see where we were going with it. 186 views. Uh, it's, it's number three. See, now, one of the things that's a little bit bugs me about the, the T2, uh, I'm sorry, the YouTube studio uh, setup is that I'm actually now competing with myself because I'm putting up the uploaded version that's all trimmed and, you know, easier to find. Uh, but the live stream is still up there, too. So there's actually like 66 views on the live stream plus 186. You know, it's important for me to stress this. So, in fact, Intel versus Tesla would be the number one uh, video uh, in recent days for the T2 Tile project if we merged together the sets of views for the live stream and the, you know, okay, whatever. Uh, but there was an interesting thing. I, I just sort of ran across this. Um, there, there was a little pop-up hover thing that I hadn't seen before. This video is reaching a wider audience on YouTube, leading to a lower click-through rate. Uh, uh, wider, less so, boiling down to don't freak out about your 4.2%. Now, 4.2% didn't look that bad as far as the T2 Tile project is going. Uh, but hey, I'll take it. Uh, you know, there have been a couple of views. Uh, the System D rant that I did, the hands-on with the BeagleBone AI, uh, um, and now Intel versus Tesla are, are likely to be the, uh, you know, the, the evergreen T Tuesday updates. You know, do it, would I rather it be the system rant and so forth? Yeah, sure, but, you know, hey, we'll take it, whatever. I mean, the bigger picture for me is it's about reaching out into the world as well as looking into the project. And we need to do both to get where the project needs to go. All right. So that's outreach. <laughs> um, reaching up. This is the stuff that I talked about just very briefly at the end last time. I'm going to expand on it uh, in some detail and hopefully do a, a demo or so. It's what we saw in the opening uh, video. 
So last week I briefly mentioned the idea of persistent transience and the goal was to have something that's bigger than uh, you could put into a single atom, a single site, a single cellular automata cell uh, uh, to start doing higher level programming, higher level coding uh, in some reasonable fashion. It's not just good enough to do a one-shot stunt. We need to actually build a programming environment that, excuse me, <laughs> that we can... Uh, uh, code in and actually get some larger scale stuff done in. So what I did is, uh, this was the picture from last week, how to code bigger objects and so forth. And, you know, I called it persistent transient, but number one, it's, that's not a great name. <laughs> it's an internal contradiction. It's very, I didn't like it. So there was this idea of the activated complex, the notion from chemistry where you get all the pieces together, that's the activated complex, and then the reaction happens. Uh, but activated complex, I tried using that activated complex dot ulam. It was way too big. Uh, uh, I boiled it down to plex. So that's the new name for persistent transient, the plex. And a plex, you know, from the Greek and Latin roots, you know, it means like weaving or braiding. Simplex means like one fold. Complex means many fold. So we're braiding together uh, different uh, uh, pieces from different atoms to make a more complex structure. That's the process of plexing. It seems okay. And it's nice and tiny. So. Now it's transient plex. Once again, it's got this gather, gather to pull together all the bits and put them in this bit storage that you use to hold them temporarily, do the event, and then scatter them back out to all the changes get recorded. Uh, um, <clears throat> now there's a new class called plexer, which is a base class for any atom that actually wants to participate in this plexing process. And the main event that uh, the main method that it needs is get plex. So we need to be able to know, given an atom, that the the large scale virtual object that we're supposed to be made out of it, we need to know what class that's supposed to be. And that's what the getplex method uh, is designed to return. Now there's also a second method, printplex, that I'll hopefully demonstrate for you that's got some new magic that I'm very happy about and it took several days to get to. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so here it is, L, uh, L2 plate. Again, this was all off of the level two plates, plates made out of level one plates, which we're doing as a process of sort of maintaining, you know, tweaking the balance between robustness and structure. At the level one plate, we're saying that's going to be relatively fragile and tightly coupled and relatively small. Therefore, uh, uh, the next scale up the level two plate, they're going to be more decoupled. They're going to be able to survive without having uh, everything all there at once because they're going to be big enough that they're going to be spreading across tiles and tiles are going to be messing up and we're going to need to have a more flexible coupling between the individual pieces of the L2 plate. And there it is. Now, uh, in addition to uh, having L2 plate base as a superclass, it also uh, inherits from uh, payload T and uh, plexer. Uh, um, and, and here it is. So, you know, it gets very twisted. It gets kind of involved. Uh, uh, but th there are several stages, right? So we have the actual atoms. They inherit from Plexer. And that they then report the type of atom, the type of virtual atom that they want to participate in. In this case, it's saying, I, I want to participate in an L2 seek plate. I'm sorry, L2 seek plex uh, atom because the goal of this first uh, test was to get uh, level two plates being able to have a sequence or a higher level control without tying up additional uh, spaces inside the L2 plate border. Uh, um, and from there, here it is. Now we get to the L2 seek plex itself, which inherits from plex because that's the, so this is the process that actually has the gather, gather and scatter methods. And in, in it case, it looks, you know, in the middle of a side of a plate. Uh, um, but that's not even it, right? The L2 seek plex is the thing that gathers the bits together and then goes shazam and makes it into the virtual object, the transition state. That is L2 plate sequencer. So we've got plex, we've got plexer. Now in this particular example, we've got L2 seek plate and then L2 plate sequencer. Wow. 
it's getting a little easier in my head. Um, and so once you get to the actual L2 plate sequencer, it has an update function, which is a lot like an atomic individual behavior function, but it's this whole upper level. So the L2 plate sequencer looks for packet coming and going to other from its neighbors. It scans out, it does sensing out into the world around the L2 plate, and it checks to see if it needs to seed neighboring L2 plates. And it's beginning to work. That's what we saw in the opening uh, video. Let's see if I can get this to work here. Uh, okay, I didn't quite get this as automated as I want to. Uh, uh, all right, how about that? Do we get that? Okay, so what we've got here is a seed my element which is going to pop up and make a little three by three bunch of my elements which is great uh, and now we start we're going to take the seed l2 plate again this is just what we saw there it is look at that uh, uh okay uh, um so this is all what we saw in the opening video but now there's the one more step uh, uh let's try this um get an atom view window up uh all right, so here, you know, now we're just looking at some random L2 plate on the border of the thing. Uh, um, and, you know, this has got all its particular details. And in particular, I think, can we now see this? Uh, let's go over even further. There you go, maybe we can see it. Uh, can maybe see the, the bits changing down here, uh, uh, right there. Uh, except they don't, uh, they're changing very slowly because there's kind of a lot going on on the workstation. And this was, you know, this is what you get. Where is the L2 plate sequencer? You can't see it. There's only one piece of it in this particular atom. Uh -huh. But now, voila, there's a new tiny little button up here. Uh, um, and here's the L2 plate sequencer. Here's this... It, distance it's got here's actually some little debugging output that's coming out in the middle uh, uh, this is what going for the full structure of l2 plate sequencer and all that stuff actually got us the uh, we can have we write we have to write our own code to do this but it can present there's default code which in fact is what this is using that allows us to see the atoms that uh, the result of pulling them together in the gather uh, like that and this of course has already you know I'd say close to already paid off off its uh, costs in uh, the... Do we have two of me on the screen? <laughs> oh dear. Uh, uh, well, okay, we, we've, we've finished the demo anyway, so let's go back to... Uh, or let's try to go back to... Uh, Alright, there we go. It still looks like two of me because... <sighs> Yes, folks, it is live. <laughs> uh, um, okay, uh, uh, so that's the demo I wanted to show. Uh, um, now, <laughs> oops, no, no, no. Decent, now I'm all messed up. Select a scene. Uh, uh, all right, and now, oh, oh yeah, well, actually, this is another thing I wanted to show as well that I'll, I'll do real quick and then I'll finish. Uh, I actually have gotten a little bit back into the tiles, uh, um, and there is w one new feature that I've been dying to see, dying to have for years. I'm sorry, the focus is so terrible here, uh, uh, but the important point is, you know, here. Oh, actually, what the heck? We'll just everything's messed up today anyway. Uh, so the, the white here's the uh, the key master. I'm going to plug in an Ethernet cable, and can you see it? Not yet. Uh, uh oh, <laughs> there it is. Uh, uh, I don't I don't know if we can really see it, but uh, uh, right up here, there is the uh, <coughs> the Ethernet address, uh, which is something that I've been wishing for for so long. Because <laughs> when you plug in one of these tiles, you know who knows where it actually lands. Uh, um, so all I can say about that is I am gradually getting back into actually dealing with the tiles. Uh, what a disaster. Uh, um, why did that happen? Uh, um, oh, of course, because I didn't go back over here. All right, so the insider's report, 
let's call all of this last stuff the insider report uh, um supposed to look for a tile failed event didn't do that but actually did get into it uh, um i have started looking at the code i got to the you know the first place where the stuff fails when there's a timeout i think i'm gonna you know go ahead and, and build a packet buffer so that we can uh keep the outgoing packets until we actually see the next packet coming uh the next uh, packet coming back in in the handshake sequence for a given event uh, uh and rebroadcast if necessary that will that solve all the problems no it won't there still will be uh bigger failures that are going to have to be dealt with but i've started a new a uh, branch on the GitHub repo for MFM called Don't Worry, Be Crappy. And I'm really trying to convince myself to just let it all go. Let the, let the errors come up to uh, visible to user level and let's just start dealing with it. Let's just see what actually happens. All right, so that was the demo for that. Uh, um, all kinds of stuff happening in Ulam 5 land. I am going to save that for another day. Uh, um, in the spirit of it would actually take some time to go through some of this stuff and and some of you know it's been three years since ulam 4 something like that at least uh, uh and so a lot of these like multiple inheritance and shared base classes that's really been around for years and they've really been key to all of the stuff that's been starting to work the plates all of this stuff absolutely depends on that uh structure i mean could it be done another way? Absolutely. But doing it this way has worked out really nice. So uh, as far as I know, the, the few folks in the world who are, are, are willing to actually play with Ulam code are all using the develop branch from GitHub. So the fact that we haven't officially released Ulam 5 is not the end of the world, but I want to get it out just to draw a line under it. And in particular, since I am making some breaking changes, uh, I would kind of like to delay Ulam 5 even yet a little further and consider some other possible breaking changes so that maybe we could make the pain at least be uh, finite in duration. All right, that's it. Um, reaching out, reaching up. Uh, um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, um, I know I'm supposed to be uh, working on the tiles. I will. I will continue to work on the tiles at the very least, designing uh, how to make the next step as far as making it more robust. Uh, but I need to pursue Plex. Uh, that that is feeling you know a lot of possibility. Uh, right now the level two plate is looking pretty robust, but it's not moving yet. So that would be the a goal that I personally secretly, if I'm allowed to do stuff that's still on the simulator rather than on the tiles, uh, I want to see L two plate uh, moving by next time. We shall see. Hope everybody's doing okay. <laughs> um, Thanks for stopping in again here live or checking in later. Get to see my incredible embarrassment as I <laughs> flail around pushing the buttons on OBS. Uh, um, I feel like, you know, this is uh, uh, part of an arc that I'm sort of going through uh, about uh, learning how to be, you know, learning how to go live. In my mind, there's always been this huge distinction between writing and speaking. And over the years, as everything's gotten recorded and Zoomed and all this stuff, and since the pandemic especially, but even way before that, the distinction between what is the difference between speaking and writing, really? Uh, um, and I now sort of understand or believe that the difference between speaking and writing is that it's speaking if there are witnesses. It's speaking if there are folks there that could, at least in principle, interact uh, uh, live uh, with you. That's what makes it speaking. And that's why conversations are sort of uh, automatically uh, kind of interesting in their way, as long as they're legit, as long as they're not scripted behind the scenes. So I'm going to keep on... <laughs> practicing doing these things live uh hopefully i'll get sort of smoother at it going forward but you know hey it's the failures that drive the plot it's the failures that make it drama thanks for coming in i hope to see you in two weeks take care